Mike Monson, welcome back to Suit Up the Podcast. How are you Hello, doing? Hello, everybody. How are you? Coffee first. Coffee first. I've got mine here. I left my Suit Up Podcast mug in the garage as yeah. happened. So now I'm using my Sleepy Eye Coffee. Yeah, coffee. yeah. Mug. And I wanted to do some product placement. Hang on just a second. Yes, always product placement. It's a healthy coffee coffee. 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 Victor McLaughlin and uh, and his little gang of jolly jokers. Gunga Din. Oh my goodness. So this movie is 1939. It is came out from RKO Pictures, directed and produced by George Stevens, stars Cary Grant, Victor McLaughlin, and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Which, if that name sounds familiar to anyone, it's because Douglas Fairbanks Sr. was Zorro, Robin Hood. He was the silent film era's Errol Flynn. And for a little while, they were hoping his son would carry the torch and just kind of dropped it. Yeah. Before we get too far into Gunga Din, so the reason we're doing the series is because we're talking about Indiana Jones 5. We are both excited and fearful and all the things in between. Mike, tell me about your like Indiana Jones fandom and how you oh. feel about Indiana Jones 5. So my Indiana uh, Jones fandom basically comes from Dave Stevens of The Rocketeer. As you know, Dave Stevens, he did the conceptual artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time as he was doing the, the Rocketeer in 78, 79, they had him. So if you go Google, you'll see Dave's, Dave's art. And it looks a little bit like what would later become you know, Indiana Jones. As far as the movie goes, the first one. Um, the Surface Chronicle put in a uh, like an advertisement, like the next big film from from George Lucas and uh, you know the guy who did did ET, but it had no information about it whatsoever. So I went to it at a movie theater in Pleasanton, be, going blind. I had seen like the trailer and I thought, oh, okay, well they have the staff of Raw and a laser beam, so obviously this is going to be some sort of you know whatever. So. Um, but I remember seeing it there and it was like an eight o'clock showing or something like that. And this would have been what that, that movie count 81, Indiana Jones, 81, 82. I'm now doing that's the... a long time ago. 82 seems like 84 was Temple of Doom. Okay. So 82 must have been Indiana Jones. 81 must have been Indiana Jones. It was. 81, yeah. 81, okay. Good job. So yeah, 81. So I went there, kind of watched the movie, and then afterwards it had, you know, one of those, uh, they used to, to have those uh, magazines that were a program, basically that, you know, talked about the film, had a little bit about the writer, had a little bit about the director, had some behind the scenes stuff. So I had that for years thinking that it was going to be like a valuable piece of ephemera. <laughs> so I, I remember going to like, oh God, sometime like in the early 90s, so a comic book store, I showed it to the guy and he said, hang on just a second. He came back and he had like a stack of like half a dozen. He goes, this thing's fucking worthless. And he goes, but it's cool if you can get it autographed. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, around here someplace, um, I have Dave Stevens autographed it because oh. it has Dave's, but I have no idea where, where it is. And of course, you know, since Dave passed away, I can't go, hey, Dave, could you sign another one? For me? <laughs> so, but that was my, my first uh, time seeing it. But I do remember watching that indiana jones film the first one and realizing that it was taken from an awful lot of like serials mm -hmm. because as a kid there was a uhf channel that ran out of sacramento i think it was yeah sacramento or stockton somewhere around there that would show you know an awful lot of those republic serials uh -huh. they would show rk everything that had fallen basically into public domain yeah the, the good stuff <laughs> yeah the really good stuff um you know, and it was on a small 13-inch black and white television. As those things are supposed to be seen, not on the big screen. You're supposed to watch it in a small, distorted television. So your your cell phone is actually the perfect medium to watch those. <laughs> it was Tubi. RKO. It was, it yeah. was uh, not, not Tubi. Quibi. It was Quibi before Quibi. Yeah, Quibi before Quibi. Yeah. But at least, you know, those guys can learn how to make a fucking buck. 
Good so point. anyway, but I, I remember watching it and then my dad's like, well, how was the film? I was like, well, this is this amazing film. It's got this boulder and it's got these snakes and it's and it's got evil Nazis who faces melt and stuff like that. It's uh, my dad's like, I thought it was going to be like Star Wars. I was like, yeah, no, it wasn't. So I remember, you know, watching that that film and then uh, the school that I was going to every year, we um, we get together and we would go to like up to Feather River to, to get everybody together in the school. And so we went into like one of the cabins and apparently there was a huge fan of Indiana Jones because somebody in an ink marker did the script for Raiders of the Lost oh. Ark all over this Redwood. Not just that, but also did drew a picture of the of like the movie poster Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I thought, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, and then when the second film came out, uh, I remember um, thinking, mm, boy, uh, this seems really familiar. And I think probably I spoke to Jim Silk at the time, and then Jim said, "Oh yeah, that that's from Gunga Din." Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, that film, the second one. You know what is it? What is was the kid's name? Ham Chunk or Ham Slice? Uh, whatever. Short Round. Short Round. Sorry, Ham Chunk. And that short that round. kid, he just won an Oscar. Yeah, I know. Supporting Oscar, which yeah. I find utterly hilarious. Apparently, yeah. he told a story. He like met George Lucas at the Oscars, or, not George Lucas, uh, Harrison Ford at the Oscars or something. Yeah, and the Harrison Ford's like. Aren't you short round? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's me more grump. Aren't you short round? Yeah. So uh, the second one, and then was it Kate Capshaw? Is in that one? Yep. Wasn't she? Wasn't she, she married dating? Steven Spielberg. Yeah. It was, yeah. So um, I remember I sort of rolled my eyes where they could be able to go fly out of the black of a plane mm -hmm. uh, on a a life raft and somehow make it. Little did I realize that somebody at Disney was like. Put a pin in that thing. I got an idea. <laughs> You're around 1989, 1990. Once we get done building this Song of the South, you know, doom flume up there, <laughs> why don't we just go ahead and just, you know, take the Enchanted Tiki Room, throw it over there, over to the, the right-hand side, and then do something. So that one, you know, I do remember, um, but again, you know, the, the little ride that went through, mm -hmm. I remember being really impressed by that. Um, and I was, I remember also seeing the um epk that came out for it and they showed the special effects and of course all that stuff's done by just up here in marin county so it's all local yokels uh the third one um uh, that, that, now things start getting a little bit hard for the the, the third one oh. you know because that one is is like basically they want to go El elsa she wolf of the ss but they can't because it's pg mm -hmm. you can tell that somebody is like we want to kind of make this a little bit more adult. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the first PG-13 movies, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was a PG. No, it wasn't the second film was the one, I think, that set the template that mm -hmm. they had to have it because it was, you know, pray to Kali, pray to Kali. Yeah. Which actually a friend of mine did have a, a dog that was a Kali. So we would get really high and do that to her. And what was her name? It was like Molly. Or something like that. So she'd be like laying her back, and we would be like, "Pray to Kali, pray to Kali Ma." Um, so I remember the third one, and then at the end, it starts getting all fucking Lord of the Rings on us. Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Where do these assholes come from?" You know, <laughs> you know the, the the chalice and everything, and and then you know they have to introduce like you know 007 into it, and it just it kind of went off the rails, you know. And they they tried to make it into one of those family friendly buddy keeping up with the joneses was the poster tagline yeah yeah i just remember like wow uh the fourth one now i know okay terrence you and i could be able to survive um if a, the atomic bomb drops you know they always told you as a kid don't go into a refrigerator go into a refrigerator and you'll be able to survive that's the only thing because I remember it's lead-lined it. Yeah, it's lead line. And so this is what I, you know, people like say, oh, did you see it? And I'm like, yeah, it's the refrigerator movie. Mm -hmm. It's like people like the first Top Guns, that volleyball movie. And like, you know, and Roadhouse. The, the difference is, like, is I will maintain that the yeah. volleyball scene in Top Gun is a transcendent moment of cinema. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Every gay man that I know said, you have to go see this incredibly gay film. They play volleyball. 
Well, how's the rest of the, my friend Alan was like, I don't know. They had, they fly around in planes for the rest of it, honey, but they had this volleyball scene. Okay. They're all in, in like short shorts and, and doing this. So that was the, the fourth one. Like I said, I didn't even bother seeing it at theater. I just waited mm -hmm. until it showed up on um, I think Amazon or whatever the, the heck it was streaming on at the time. Yeah. And I just remember just thinking this probably was a placeholder for mm -hmm. intellectual property that somebody over at Disney or somebody over at Paramount said, hey, we got to go do something. And so that way we can kind of keep this going in perpetuity. So what's actually fascinating about this is I was looking up, I got a book called Tales from Development Hell. It was published in like the mm -hmm. early 2000s. Yes. yes. And in that book, they actually have a chapter on the unmade fourth Indiana Jones movie. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is you see in that book, they talk about... Just there have been reports for years about this unwritten, unfinished script and that might involve aliens and Area 51. And, you know, some of these claims are outrageous. And I'm saying they're going, they actually got a lot of details right on what yeah. would become the fourth movie. Yeah. Which surprised me. Just a sidebar, if you've read that book, then you've read about the Michael O'Donoghue film, Planet of the Trailers. Planet of the Trailers? Yeah, the one that Michael O'Donoghue, um, who was known as Mr. Mike from Saturday Night Live, he has one of the legendary films scripts that is out there, which is like, what is it, the planet of like the lost trailers or something. And apparently it's one of those things that like um, Tim Heidecker would be able to make it now because it basically is so just inside information. Um, but when uh, O'Donoghue wrote it, it basically was like a huge fuck you to Hollywood. And of course, uh -huh. this is the guy who wrote, uh, O'Donoghue wrote Scrooge, and which oh. is a, a great, great script that got- Fantastic. Absolutely screwed up. You know, um, uh, the, the, Tom Kenny, who also wrote um, Animal House, uh, mm -hmm. wrote uh, Scrooge before he, Tom Kenny. There's a great story about Tom Kenny against Sidebar, he commits suicide, he goes to Maui and just like off the side of the hill. But um, that one, so yeah. It's it's within that book, and it, it's like one of the legendary screenplays there, um, and it was just just full of so much bile and <laughs> hatred towards everybody and everything. Um, so again, yeah, let's get back to yeah, get uh, back Indiana. to uh, Indiana yeah. Jones. So how are, what do you feel about the the fifth one now? Like what what are your expectations, especially knowing that it's not Spielberg directing? Uh, I can't wait until it's free on Paramount Plus because if you have, if hey, if you use Walmart, guess what you get for free? Paramount Plus. Guess what you get for free? This Indiana Jones movie, which is probably going to be it's just, a, it looks like an absolute shit burger. This looks like it is like you're basically, you're, this is like Legos. Mm -hmm. You know, you're putting it together and you have all the moving parts and you just pray, pray that you know what, you don't leave one of the pieces out on the carpet in the middle of the night and step on it and you're in pain. This, I think, is going to be that Lego in pain like installment. Um, and apparently now, I guess they're going back and, and these are Paramount or someone saying that they, since they have that intellectual property, they want to go do a reboot of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles? Oh, you see, I, so that's that's a hard one for me because I know that they, they talked about doing Originally, they were going to do a prequel series on Disney Plus of like Ravencroft. That's it. Thank you. It was going yeah. to be the the teacher. So like uh, Ravencroft is supposed to be the Ravenwood. Sorry, Ravenwood. Ravenwood, so yeah. It would okay. have been Marion's dad who was Indy's right. professor. Now, <clears throat> I'll admit that's interesting because you're not going to mess up the Indiana Jones timeline by doing right. that. Like it's yeah, a it's tangential. Conical. Completely conical. Yeah. Yeah. Something that they can do differently. But Disney Plus's shows haven't been great, so I wasn't necessarily on board. Mando season three has not been kind at all. So I, I was like, eh, and they've already canceled it. They they're like, yeah. no, we're just done, which is smart. Really, yeah. I I just I'm my fingers are crossed. The only thing that I'm holding my faith in is James Mangold as an excellent director, and yeah. it's the same team that wrote Ford v Ferrari. Yeah, yeah, and which is good. Yeah. So like I I'm hoping that it keeps the boat from sinking, but also I 
every time we see a new trailer and I just see more and more CG, I'm like, Ugh, but practical yeah. effects. Well, they should do the same thing. The what's his name from Evil Dead? Remember, he had his own like Roscoe oh. P. Coltrane. What was what was that? TBS had it or whatever. Um, it was called he... Ash versus Evil Dead. They no, 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 show. no. The one where he plays a cowboy. Oh, you mean yeah. um yeah, what's its face? Um ah, Bruce Campbell's guy... cowboy show. Yeah. It was yeah. uh and I should know about this because they actually filmed some of it up in Marin County and somebody said, Hey, do you want to go up and go go see the the new uh Sam Raimi thing that was there? That because that was all proto um Redford County or something like that, right? Yeah, it's Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. Which Briscoe County Jr. You know what's ironic about yeah. this? There was a similar show that Harrison Ford was in. Mm. I think around the same time. Uh, Harrison okay. Ford. Which, side comment, Chronicles of Young Indiana Jones is a highly underrated series, in oh, my opinion. Oh, yeah, it's great. Amazing. I especially yeah. love, there's an episode where in, Harrison Ford shows up as like the pre-bit Right. Apparently they were filming The Fugitive at the time and it was like on the same soundstage and they were like, hey, okay. do you mind just showing up? Yeah. And yeah. it's like him, he just shows up. He's like got a beard. Yeah, It's in the ice. They're like in a yeah. cabin and he plays the saxophone. And I'm like, Harrison Ford in his 50s like still could play Indiana Jones. Oh, Harrison yeah. Ford in his 80s? <laughs> yeah, probably not. I mean, you know, it's sad that the that the kid who played young Indiana Jones decided to, to get a hot dose in front of the Viper room, right? So, um, but yeah, I remember watching that and it was like, I do remember that it ha was great because it just was, was it an hour or was it 30 minutes? It seemed like- So they, I think it changed, the format changed a little bit because they, yeah. originally they did like two 30 minute bits. We won with you. him as a okay. kid, then one with him as an adult and both were like a joint story okay. with George C. Hall. That's the one thing I regret on the DVD release. They got rid of George Hall as like old Indiana Jones in what the they, they, beginning. They want to fuck him out of, uh, out of money? They did I, not I, pay his, uh, his, his, his dues to the SAG dues. The SAG, yeah. Uh, I think what it was is because they had, they re-released at the same time that uh, Temple uh, Crystal Skull was coming out. So they didn't want to have it like seem like it messed with the timeline. But I just remember one episode, I, I was able to like find the clips on YouTube. A, he has an eye patch. Old Indiana Jones with an eye patch. If I want him to lose an eye at the end of this movie <laughs> with, for no other reason than that. Oh, but he hit him in the eyeball when he was in the refrigerator. He, there's like this total, like you could tell this was filmed in like the 80s, 90s, because there's a scene where like this donut guy, he's like, this little old lady asks for this kind of donut and George C. Hall's behind her. And she, he's like, listen, lady, he's got like long hair. He's yeah. got an, he's got an earring dangling off. He looks very much like he doesn't care. He's like, listen, lady, I've had a really long day and we don't have that kind of donut. George C. Hall walks over, uses his cane, slams the guy's head on the counter and goes, listen here, young man, you have no idea what the meaning of tough day is back when I was in World War One, and then goes into Okay, the and then story. transition and go all the way back. Yeah, you know what? I know the reason why they didn't do that. Okay, that's good, because they, they saved everybody from do the wipe. Okay, yes. Going back in time, you know, the ether. Yes, <laughs> so it, it had its moments. So, Indiana okay. Jones 5, we're just kind of, we're I, I will tell you how it is. I will see it in theaters with my yeah. Fedora on. We'll see if right. they let me take my whip in. I've got my jacket yeah. all set for that. Yeah. But well, I mean, and, and next time there's like a Comic Con or something like that, I mean, you know, definitely go go in character and wait for either people to say hi or just basically boo you <laughs> and just start throwing stuff and like, are you the asshole responsible for five? Terrence, fuck you. Thanks I, for ruining I, my childhood. I went to uh, the Le Chicago Comic Con as Indiana Jones that. last yeah. year and. Definitely best, best time in the world. Yeah, but they didn't have the, any of the, of like, that's the other thing, too. Hey, if you're going to have Indiana Jones, you're going to have to have people dress up as Nazis. I, you know. So that's, I, I'm also excited about Mads Mikkelsen in the movie, but that's yeah. only because he's my favorite Bond villain. Okay. In Casino Royale, him okay. as Le Chiffre. He just has, I mean this in the best way possible, foreign menace. That, like, yeah. James Bond idea of anyone that's a foreigner is obviously right. a bad guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. 
them using Mads Mikkelsen in this, I think is like the perfect casting choice. Yeah, well, per yeah, you're absolutely right. But just uh, again, I mean, I don't want anybody with like a Nazi armband, but they have, why isn't there the, the guy who, you know, was like going to mm -hmm. go fight him? Who I believe if I'm not mistaken, that guy was a professional wrestler. He was. Yeah, he because I, I kind of vaguely remember him like, you know, wrestling for God, I think he wrestled, you know, for like Vern Gotti or something like that. Because I was like, OK, I kind of recognized that guy, uh, you know, so somebody should dress up as like that guy, you know, I, I would love to see that. That yeah. would be amazing. Yeah. So okay. Gunga Din. Yes. When was the first time you watched this movie? So the first time I watched Gunga Din probably would have been 75. You okay. know, I must have been like around nine or 10 years old, mm -hmm. somewhere around in that thing. And um, there was a UHF channel that ran in the Bay Area that was out of Stockton, Sacramento. And so they would just have filler. And so they would just, they probably, what they did is they got the RKO pack, which was uh -huh. big. And I think Blackhawk Films at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they would just send it out. And so you would just show it like a Saturday, you know, afternoon matinee. So I just remember watching it, um, but it didn't really register very much. I always thought it was really corny that, mm -hmm. that the thing that upset me the most at the time probably was why is there this girl? Why is, why is yes. this girl like here? Who, why are you here? You know? This, this movie. So this is the first time I've seen Gunga Din. Okay. Which is amazing because, like, I know the phrase, you're a better man than I, Gunga Din. Like, I've read Rudyard Kipling. Kipling's one of my favorite poets. If is, like, indelibly marked in my head. One of my best conversations with an Uber driver was explaining to him the line, and the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire. Really? Literally, best exchange with an Uber driver ever. And, but that, so I like Kipling. So I hadn't okay. seen this movie. And when you had, I gave you the list of, like, Let's pick some one of these. Right, right. I'm glad you picked it because I love Cary Grant. Oh, now, yeah. I'm not certain how much I love him after this movie because, like, <laughs> so I won't get into it. There's just, there's a, this movie is an interesting blend to me because it is definitely from 1939. Oh, yeah. It's and a product of its time. That's, I think, the main thing that if anyone decides to go watch this movie, be aware of. This yeah. is something still has the taste of the 30s in it. And, don't expect modern blockbuster. Yeah, and I believe even the last time that I saw it on TCM, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Mankiewicz went out and kind of gave everybody like a, hey, <laughs> your Sam Jaffe is a great character actor. Yes, let's just let's just frame it yes. as Sam Jaffe as a character actor. Yes, because you know. again, that was just one of those things that. Uh, so we'll just we'll. Start right there. Sam yeah. Jaffe is a character actor who plays Gunga Din. He is a white man who is um, tanned significantly. No. no, he's not tanned. They just put they put boot polish all over him. They they, they did yeah, because they're shooting black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my, that just I watched the movie and I'm like that doesn't age very well. Yeah. But the at the same token, it's one of those things that like I've heard a lot of arguments with like the Bond novels are getting. Uh, have gone through an yeah, edit recently. Yeah, they're doing recently. the reboot on the Bonds. Yeah. Well, no, no, they're, the Bond novels, the books themselves, they're yeah. republishing them and they went through and censored bits. Yeah, I know, they, they turned down a little bit of the volume on it. Yeah. And so it's just worth keeping in mind, this is a product of its time. It is, yeah. this is part of the way Hollywood acted back then, not the way it would act today. I believe also, if you take a look at Sam Jaffe and the other films that he was in at the time, I, he they told him probably you know sam you got to lose a little bit of weight to look i was more thinking like that too. he looked very frail in comparison because if you take a look at him in his later films that he did mm -hmm. you know which we won't get in into those but i mean you know sam like me he had a more of a rounded rounded face mm -hmm. um but oh, sam I... also was great because he could play yeah he was an know, amazing character actor. characters yeah well, i mean i was that was the other funny thing so like i just watched asphalt jungle and he oh. plays the doctor in it. And I was like, oh, oh my, this is quite oh, the yeah. turn from oh, yeah. Ham well, Doctor to... Yeah. Doc is is a doctor in, in the sense that, you know, Dr. Oz was one. I mean, yeah. you know. Uh, but yeah, again, you know, that that a character actor like Sam Jaffe could be able to pull it off. When you watch it, you need to have a little bit of cultural sensitivity. But the thing is, is that 
he's at least the one thing you can say about Sam Jaffe. He's very sincere with the role. Yes. He he's not, you know, like trying to condescend. No. I and was very impressed. It, one time he probably went to an Indian restaurant mm -hmm. <laughs> or met somebody. And at least he had some of the affectations and mannerisms down. Mm -hmm. So, and I Jaffe was... apparently was a very progressive person. So mm -hmm. I can imagine that happening. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me because I was genuinely impressed. So when it, we first start with the movie, I expected that Sam Jaffe's character just, oh, we get a bumbling sidekick character. But really, they do such a great job with the character. And it makes it worthwhile having his name as the role. Like, I was Save so Save that curious. for Sammy Davis Jr.'s and Sergeant 3, which we can get into later. We'll, we'll get into that <laughs> later. So films directed and produced by George Stevens. It was supposed to be directed by Howard Hawks which I'm so disappointed he didn't get to it. And it was for the worst reason on earth. Yeah. There, you know, because bringing up baby was, was a, a shit burger. Bringing up baby didn't make any money. And the studio was like, you know, they looked at Stevens go, just said, Hey, meat and potatoes guy, you know, go in and do it. You, mm -hmm. the other thing too, is your buddies with Victor McLaughlin. So, you know what? Great. Stevens, you two guys, you go ahead and just work out all of, of the stuff that was there. I do like how, they switched the roles of just about yes. everybody. I, that I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. So originally, uh, Cary Grant was supposed to play Tommy Valentine, who's one yeah. of the... So there are three main characters in this movie that people need to know. There's Cary Grant, who plays Archibald Cutter. There's uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., who plays Tommy Valentine. And my favorite is McChesney? McChesney? McChesney. 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 And they call him Mac. They call him Mac. Mac. But that's Victor McLaughlin, who yeah. Victor McLaughlin, I was so happy to see him in this movie because I love the John Ford movies. Oh, and yeah. he shows up as a consistent character actor for John Ford throughout oh, yeah. most of his movies, the most memorable of which is in The Quiet Man, he plays Will Donahar. Jesus, yeah. And he's just, just I mean, any Irish people that are out there. I apologize in, in, you know, in perpetuity for that because it was just, it's one of those, those roles where McGoughlin just chewing up scenery left and right. And it's just, all right, here he goes. So, you know, the other thing about just the sidebar about uh, Victor McGoughlin, you also knew that he was like one of those America firsters too. Really? That, oh God. Yeah. Victor McGoughlin is British, you know, assimilated to American culture, like to um, play polo. Uh, go hang out with people, uh, had guns. And then the other thing, too, is that he apparently, if I remember the story correctly, he was making people take fucking loyalty oaths. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and, and people and the, you know, people in, in, you know, more liberal newspaper people are like, this guy is like a fascist. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm a patriotic American. No, you're not. You're actually, you're a British citizen who got your citizenship here. And I think he actually got it not the normal way he married somebody in hollywood so if you're that much of an american patriot you shouldn't be automatically you know basically given sort of a free pass because you're boning your wife so but we'll put that aside victor mclaughlin it just one of you know that whole john ford group of of individuals there kind of have some politics that are these days would be more in line to contemporary, you know, yeah. we won't get into too much of that, but yeah, he did also into, win. Yeah. He also won the best, uh, Academy Award for best actor. I think actually oh, yeah. he was the first one to win that particular award. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, in 1935. Anyway, so Gunga Din film opens with one of the best title sequences I have ever seen. Every time the gong is hit. Yeah. It, the, the gong, like it ripples. And it changes the titles. And I was like, wow, like for the 30s especially, that's really good. Oh, yeah, for sure. And uh, I did say something in here, which let me go pull it up. Uh, and because we can go ahead and debate whether or not. So it says, those patrons of this picture dealing with the worship of the god Kali are based upon historical fact. 
those portions of this picture dealing with the worship of the goddess Kali are based on historical fact. Um, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that is absolutely raging horseshit. It's about just one thing only, and it's about that. Now, I'm still confused. Is it the because they have three different pronunciations that go on in this yeah. film, depending on the actor? It's the tuggy, uh huh, the thuggy, and then the way Fairbanks just offhandedly says, "Nah, please," you know. And so, uh, so there's three different ways of of pronouncing it. Um, I do. They they did get it right with the whole scarf. I do mm -hmm. like that because that's yeah. just yeah, and especially in black and white where they would just mm -hmm. take it and then silent killers which again that's what the cult did you know um so but i guess we're putting the part the cart before the horse a little bit so they they opening of the film we get through a title sequence uh british regiment is stopped by these basically they're like we're pilgrims we just need so safe passage then in the middle of the night and this you had made the comment uh before that this is very much like a western you oh, can immediately absolutely. tell this because the scene is basically like Indians, and again, I'm using Indians in terms of movie Indians. It's a different yeah. thing than the actual people. And they're just like getting up and in the middle of the night and killing everyone. Yeah. yeah. It's, it is a like quick, immediate scene that gives you an idea. Oh, so this is kind of what we're doing. They that, even have the horses attached mm -hmm. with their bridles that are out there, yeah. which again is, is a, a well known a Western trope, trope for bad, bad engines that's out there so it always just shows you know the cavalry's horse is there they're sleeping innocently you know but this one you don't have somebody slashing your neck you just have these silent killers that just do this so that i do like so when george stevens directed this i do like the fact that there's no music whatsoever mm -hmm. and it's just very muted so he got that because often you would have you know especially in a, in a western beat you know music playing in the background but this one silence and it's very menacing so he's at the beginning terrence he sets the mood he sets, sets the mood, mood for something that's going to be going on and then the colonel weed is the name of the colonel which i just sat back and laughed you also don't they don't really tell you who he is you just accept oh, no. that he is the important british man because he's yeah. sitting behind a desk acting more british than everyone else and drinking his tea they do have random characters that just come and go with no explanation. And it's left to the viewer in order to, you know, just accept, oh, yeah, well, that has to be the so-and-so. Or so, yeah, he has to be, yeah. I'll admit, I was fairly impressed with that because I feel like otherwise they're not, they're letting the audience just figure things out as it's going along instead of oh, going, sure. here is large blocks of exposition on everything. It just basically drops us right into the story, which is all of a sudden the the telegraph has gone out literally mid they're trying to search for things and that moment again it's that they do a great job having just that little tension of all of a sudden he's like he's sending sos signals he's sending danger signals and then all of a sudden nothing not there and the hook so the iconography that they use all the way through the film of that hook which i, I forget the the name that that it has but you see the guy up there again what what a bad Indian would do, which would be like with a tomahawk. They've just replaced mm -hmm. it with the thuggy hook. That's yeah, like there. an axe type thing. Yeah, axe a and pick. It, a pick that it's got. You know, it looks like something you would use in a fireplace to, mm -hmm. or to to brain somebody. So it obviously has some sort of that has significance and that really you know sets the mood for these guys are bad. These mm -hmm. guys are are not what they they seem. And of course, then as you know you you leave all this just darkness and stuff like that and the first thing you have is terrence a bar fight i know so here here's where we start getting to the screwball element of it and this is where i think the movie i struggle with is it's two competing story tones yeah we have they want this to be a screwball comedy but then George Stevens does such a great job of building these dramatic tense moments and so those two things are constantly like buffed bumping up against each other really i can see this being more like a guardians of the galaxy-esque type movie yeah in today's day and age where if this was remade it would be more like that where they found a way to create or even dungeons and dragons they the the new one not the old one they they found a way to construct a comedy action film oh, where yeah. it has these tense moments yeah. whereas in this case they're really it's very stark 
the difference. So they have the bar fight and that's when we're introduced to our three sergeants and they are very clearly the guys that are asked to it they're it's kind of swashbuckling it, like, oh, it, it has that element yeah. right there immediately as it's this bar fight they take out their their sabers and fight all the time oh my goodness bayonets so, and sabers fighting by the way in this film you can tell that they wanted <laughs> this to be like they thought okay india this is the place where we can be zorro meets western is kind of how they thought this. Literally, I think they just thought nobody knows anything about India. We could just go ahead and take Captain Blood, mix it up yes. with like you know with a uh, any standard Western that that's out there, and then just make it a buddy comedy. Which okay, so this actually did remind me when we introduced the three characters. I was like, this actually reminds me of the introduction of the Three Musketeers. Almost Absolutely. like Absolutely Pat. Yeah, we've got the big strong guy. Yeah, we've got the smart guy. And we've yeah. got the silly guy. Yeah. It's basically the Three Stooges, which you can also make an argument is a ripoff of the Three Musketeers. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But uh, Cutter's Cary Grant. The, the, <laughs> I, I love Cary Grant. Like, yeah. 100%. One of the icons of men's style. He is charm incarnate. Yeah. Yet in this movie, he is trying to do a British accent. Well, but he was British, remember? Exactly, yeah, which is why it's weird. Elite. Yeah. Because but, he's has the transit, but it sounds like Cary Grant voice, like the Cary Grant transatlantic yeah. accent, trying to do you a good British this, uh, governor. Yeah. Well, and again, just like random characters, that accent comes and goes. So you could tell that basically, I've always, you know, I'm watching that film, I was like, watching his performance, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Grant and McLaughlin were out drinking last night. <laughs> there there are certain points where you're just like yeah the boys were out and carrie is just sort of he's coming in he's just mailing it in because he's that good of an actor yes you know and just choose scenery and that's so originally uh carrie grant was supposed to play valentine's character which is a far more sedate character that there's not a lot going on in the story for cutter's the one that has all of the the weird wild things to do and yeah. say and kind of big eyes big reactions which does admittedly work because Cary Grant does have comedic presence. That's the reason oh, why. Yeah. I, I heard, I read a book on uh, wit and that book, the posit that they had for like why Cary Grant is like so effortlessly charming is that he looks like a perfect human being who finds everything just as funny, like the situation he's in, as you do. Oh, he yeah. is the knight in shining armor who also is a jester. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, G Cary Grant does play that. He plays that role to a T, and um, and he plays it very well. And he has two, you know, foils to, you know, he has one who's an over-the-top, you know, Porthos character, and he has the other one that that is, you know, the Aramis character, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but um, uh, the the other thing about about Grant in that film is is that. You know, they have him as the, the comedic lead that introduces Gunga Din. Mm -hmm. So in Which... another way, George Stevens was somewhat sensitive. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, McGoughlin's character is like, get this guy out of here. You're not a soldier. And it's not because I don't like you. It's just you're not a soldier. You're mm -hmm. not you're not regiment. The Fairbanks character is just like, well, what did harm? It's no big deal. Just let him give a bugle. Who cares? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm out of here in a week anyway. So, and then Cary Grant just takes him under his wing. Is like, but that's the other thing. Din, Dean, and then Din. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh my goodness. So yeah. just getting back into the plot, because I want to talk about the scene with um, Cutter and Din when we get there. The So they're recruited back home. They're sent out to do basically reconnaissance, find out what happened at the place where the telegraph went out. They're three engineers. So that's why in theory, they're supposed to be able to do it. Yet- it really, that's such a weird moment in the movie because basically all it is is an action set piece. We have, have yeah. to have an excuse for action here. And they show up. It seems like it's abandoned. But then Valentine's like just wandering around. And I'm going to call them thugs just for thugs. Yeah. brevity. Thugs. The thugs show up and try killing him. And yeah. then Cutter and Mac show up and try save him. Comes this big shootout. Like they think that they've got the upper hand. And then 
all these thugs show up and they're going to attack them. This is where we start getting like that screwball action. And I liked it and hated it at the same time because it does that speed up thing for the movements. Thank you. I did notice that last night is that basically they took frames out, especially when mm -hmm. they fight mm -hmm. in order to, because, you know, you and I are going like this. So they, they did that. So it does have, and I don't think that was done for comedic effect. I think it was just done for, you know, which was a typical thing an editor would do for more mm -hmm. action. And it helps yeah. move the narrative along. But it looks real herky-jerky. Yeah. In hindsight. Yeah. Especially if you're watching it in digital and could be able to kind of stop the frame rate. And so you could literally tell it's like, okay, every six, just go ahead, just pull it out, editor. Six, just pull it out. And so um, we, when he, they get a chair shot, that was the other thing too. What, how do you have a chair? And so he just gets the, the chair shot in. So again, um, but yeah, so it, it just, it, it adds a little bit of, but again, you would do that in a, in a Western, in a barroom yeah. fight. Yeah. You know? And, and okay. So I love, there's one comedic like set piece here that I actually was like, this was good writing, good, good storytelling. So they, they basically, uh, Valentine jumps into a wagon that happens to have dynamite in it. Again, very Western-esque trope. And then they start throwing the dynamite at the bad guys. And it's yeah. amusing. It's funny. Yeah. Well, then Valentine's running across a roof with jumping to a rooftop, holding one of the sticks. His foot, he literally just slams through one foot roof, into the yeah. roof and drops the drops the um the the dynamite. Yeah. And then he's like trying to reach it with his sword, yeah. which again is just entertaining. Cutter runs over, grabs it throws it over and it lands on a staircase as the yeah. bad guys are going up and it starts to roll down. They all run away. They all run and away. One enterprising guy runs over, grabs it, and is about to throw it up and then look up boom. and it's two of the yeah. the sergeants. They shoot him and it goes yeah. boom. Yeah. That was a good like sequence. I yeah. liked that sequence. Well, you know, the other comedic effect that they had in there, which was, you know, they bring in the elephant. Which I, you know, the elephant is one of those things, and that is one of my favorite scenes. It's in there. It's like, come on, baby, don't you want, you know, Annie, like, Annie, Annie the, the elephant. elephant. Which, of course, they're just giving her basically the alcohol in order to get her to feel better, I guess. So they get to that when they get back from the the elephant comes in after they've returned from this fight, yeah. and during the walk home, we find out Valentine's leaving in a week yeah. and he's going to get married he's going to go into the tea business yeah tea business so, tea and what is it tea and suits or tea something and, like that yeah which i'll admit i was like oh hey I, i'm on board for that tea and suits there you go, um yeah. but i get joan fontaine yeah okay that sounds not too bad the, the you know? two carrie grant uh cutter and mac are like horrified at this and they're about ready to have this big fight and then they show up and they get like regimental order they walk in they right. show colonel weed the pickaxe and then they that identifies it's the thugs it's Kali yeah. they've resurfaced we get a different movie now for like another 20 minutes mm -hmm. where it does we have Annie the elephant which here's the thing I do like about that scene it shows that Victor McLaughlin actually cares about something Mac oh, yeah. as a character because yeah. otherwise he just kind of he likes his buddies and he yells at everyone yeah but this gives him like something that he genuinely cares about this elephant wants to take care of it and yeah, they give Annie's not feeling well. He's like comparing her forehead to his and they give her them. It says elephant elixir. Yeah. Yeah. Patent medicine, basically. Yes. Yeah. And, and they're Pure like, alcohol. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Give it just a little bit. And that's yeah. a wonderful setup for the gag that's about to come. Yeah. Which is perfect. Yeah. But and, Annie the elephant also is a good way for them to introduce something that also has a connection to Gunga Din. Mm-hmm. So, because Din also, you know, as we find out later, knows how to ride the elephant. Also, basically, he is an accomplished horseback rider, which you find out later. Yeah. So, again, this guy, Din can do it all, man. Din can do it all. So, we also yeah. are really introduced to Gunga Din in, in, like, his fullness at this point in the story. Yeah. Because he's doing, while well, everyone else is doing their marching orders, he's, like, standing on the other side of one of the barrack buildings and he's marching and following because he wants to be a soldier right and carrie grant just sees him and he he indulges him and yeah. it's a really actually a nice scene because he's actually treating him like an equal 
and yeah. he's well as equal as it is in the british army he's an officer everyone else is garbage that's just the way it goes right. and but it's still a really sweet scene he has a bugle that he's not supposed to have but hunter lets him keep it and again just it's a really good moment because you get more of who gunga is as a character and Absolutely. for those who don't know the the premise of who gunga din is is he's a i'm probably going to mispronounce it but bishti which is a a water bearer yeah so his job is just to and we see him during the action scene ahead of time he's like literally going up to everyone like offering them water as the fight is going on even the opposition even the opposition opposition, you know when when members of the thuggy are laying there and dying he is you know and i believe that's in the kipling well maybe not in the kipling but at least it just shows that hey this yeah. this character here is is a human, you know, mm-hmm. and then I take my job very seriously. One thing I do like about that, and this may have proceeded on the waterfront, where Jaffe hits the top of his head, and you see it move, and then Grant puts in, oh, you almost took your your eye out, or what? Just a little like throwaway line like that, so you could tell it was improv that mm-hmm. was right there because they must have gone through, you know, a hundred takes of, of just doing it one after another, and you could just tell that Cary Grant's like, okay, run it again, run it again, run it again, and Jaffe does it, just hits the top of the turban, he goes, oh, you, you hit the, the top of your turban there. So, yeah, so everybody is like, oh, yeah, you know, this guy's a genius because on the waterfront, uh, Eva Marie Saint drops her glove, uh-uh, nope, nope, it was Sam Jaffe, and uh, and Archie Leach, you know, preceded you by, by decades. Take that, Mumbles. Take that, Mumbles. So, we... They're about to get sent on the mission, but we have all of this buildup and drama of Valentine is going to get married. And they're Cutter and Mac, they're just like literally sitting there sulking. For a second, I felt like we were in a Little Rascals movie. Yeah. As they're like, yeah. oh, our buddy, like, yeah, he made they're just bad. Club. Yeah, yeah. And he's going to leave. We're not going to have adventures with Maymore. And admittedly, yeah. like, they do a good job in setting up. Oh, his replacement's here. Cur- Sergeant Higginbottom. Yeah, I who know. Who is the biggest yeah. ass you have ever met. Well, very proper. And also, you notice that mustache changes position all the way through, which I think Mel Brooks may have stolen that for, like, oh. some gag. I can't remember what film it was, but the mustache is over here. No, excuse me. It's the hump in, in Young Frankenstein. Because yes. the mustache goes from here, it goes over there, and it's, like, it doesn't have symmetry yeah i was curious if he was anyone important so i looked up his career the actor played him yes his, his roles were always just being the proper englishman yeah that yeah. was literally the only thing he only did. thing that he had just a meat and potato characters actor yeah yeah just always just playing kind of an obnoxious stiff so cutter and mac are invited to the betrothal dance prior to valentine's wedding mm-hmm. and they 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 show up and they hear Valentine talking to uh, his lady love, who's played by Joan Fontaine, Emily. And he's explaining how, oh, yes, I was very, very brave and daring. And he's basically all the things that he did wrong. He says the other two did wrong, knowing that they're listening just to mess with them. Behind so, the bushes, everybody. Yeah, it's he's like, and if you don't believe me, you can ask them. They're right over there. There you can talk to the bushes. But and I do like when Fontaine shows up. And I, I gotta go back. I swear to God, they throw honky tonk piano, dun 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 dun, just out of nowhere because it's like, again, she looks like the local out of a, a western. She looks like a school marm with the yeah. high collar and the the hat and carrying around the parasol and things like that. It just you know, uh, this feels a lot like a cavalry movie. That exactly you yep. would like. There are moments in this I'm like, this reminds me of she wore a yellow ribbon down to the fact Victor McLaughlin is in it. Yeah, 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 pretty goddamn close. Probably so, one time or another, yeah, they probably just said, yeah, just throw Fontaine in there. She's a gamer, too. You could just tell that basically she knows that her role is just bullshit. It's just basically to be window dressing. She plays it nicely. She, she does. Great, yeah. She does a great job. She does everything with the script that they ask her to do. Yeah, yeah. And she just has this attitude like, no, men. (laughs) Which just lets it go. So they have a, this is one of my favorite gags in it, just because it's a great moment. Basically, Cutter and Mac are so annoyed with this whole thing. All the bullshit. They're like, 
we're going to spike the punch bowl with the elephant elixir, which of course they brought with them just for doing that. Yeah. And Cary Grant just steps in front of the punch bowl, puts his hands behind his back. You hear the pop of the quirk and then it pours out water. What I laugh at is it sounds like he's taking a piss. Just the way the water's leaking. And eventually McLaughlin's like, save a little for the elephant. <laughs> save a little for the elephant. But the other thing too, it just it's like a magician that's like, I'm going to pour everything into the vase or, you know, into the thing. Oh, look, it, it's magically, it, it goes on comedically too long. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why it works. And McLaughlin's it's... back there the entire time mugging for the camera, like, you know, hurry up, hurry up. Somebody's about to, to show up. Just like kids, you know, at college trying to spike a punch bowl. Which is what makes it so good. Admittedly, like, this is, a I went... Good writing. Good job writing this part of the script because yeah. immediately the worst thing that could happen is what happens next, which is oh, yeah. the colonel and his like other high ranking buddy go up and are like, let's have some punch. And McLaughlin's like, oh, no, sir, you you don't want to do that. Well, and then right before that, just out of nowhere, suddenly comes Joan Fontaine's father, who is a well-known, I forget the character actor's name, but he always would play kind of fey British. He just suddenly just randomly shows up and it's like, oh, where's your doctor? Where's your daughter? Oh, well, I'll go, I'll go look for her. And then just disappears. And then, and then these two guys come in. So again, the, the little bit of like Gunga Din apparently is also time travel too. So it's got some science fiction characters. Again, they just sort of boo, 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 boo just fall in random places for no apparent reason. And again, the viewer is supposed to just naturally assume, well, of course the father would just be here all the way in India from, you know, from, from London. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, just, there's so many things. Yeah, exactly. They so McLaughlin's thing is like getting the, to get them to not drink it, he sticks his hands in the punch bowl for again, comedically overly long time to search yeah. for a fly that's there. And then he's like, yeah. look, sir, I found it. And then they're like, nope. well, I guess we don't want any punch and just nope. walk nope. away. No. Nope. Well, then they, uh, again, they have the conversation about Hickenbottom. Yeah. Hickenbottom. Hickenbottom. And uh, yeah. they give him the, the punch. punch. Yeah. They give him like two glasses before it takes him out. And he's, yeah. alas, not going to be able to make it to the, yeah. the the mission. So they have to bring in Ballantyne. And this is, so next day, this is, again, one of those moments where I'm sitting here going, are we watching Gunga Din or are we watching some kind of like rom-com where it's like the buddy movie where it's bro love should matter more than yeah. female love? Yeah, did we leave out uh, Annie's of uh, violent assault on on pr uh, prison number one? That that comes in the next next the next part. scene. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Valentine's standing like a scarecrow with just curtains draped over him, and they're I think they're trying to like really show he is going to live a miserable existence if he leaves the army and gets married. How yeah. could he? And that's yeah. when they break the news to him, you have to go on the mission with us. Yeah. And this has been like an hour into the movie. This is an hour into the movie, and we're still like not moving the plot along. I was very surprised. But we get to, finally, things are happening. They're going after the thugs. But Cutter and, Mac Cutter and Mac, they're trying to conspire how to keep Ballantyne yep. in the army. And that's when Matt Cutter, he goes, I know what we can do. Din has told me about the Golden Temple. Oh, yeah. And the immediately map. Max, like... Which is at the beginning of the film. Because at the yeah. beginning of the film, yeah. that's the reason they had that bar fight was because they sold them a map that like Eating the shit out of real. a Scotsman. <laughs> yes. And so then Mac throws Cutter in jail because he's like, I'm just not dealing with this. Moving on. And that is when we get Annie's break of the, yeah. the jail. He get Dean runs up to cutter in the prison at night and he's like i just went there and the golden temple is still there and he's like oh great get me out of here get me out of here and he goes here here saeed and he gives him a fork <laughs> just fork yeah but i also love how the prison bar is there bamboo with with uh with um uh leather around it I, okay all right fine you know so i mean it's there or it's just like redwood it doesn't it doesn't necessarily because literally i mean Cary grant could just you know, do that. rock on it. But they bring in Annie, and they bring in she's Annie. a million bucks. 
Annie, the, he's like, Annie, just just grab the bar. Just grab the bar. Annie just slowly, it's like she's just leaning forward against the wall. And then just the whole thing starts falling apart. And yeah. miraculously, everyone survives. We have a Benny Hill-esque scene where the guard like tried to do something and the door like crashes over crashes. and yeah. he's standing through the door frame. They start shooting and then the guard realizes, oh, wait, it's one of ours. So he shoots uh, yeah. over his head. And again, that's the other thing we haven't talked about is that Cary Grant, the, if anybody see Bring Up Baby, where he just does that affectation and he does it to much better dramatic effect in Arsenic and Old Lace where he goes, oh, oh yes. <laughs> So it's just mugging for the camera and just that great, great, great sound that he makes when he's <laughs> excited, when he's frustrated, or when he's like trying to really just sort of drive home a point of just like, this isn't good. He's acting like Shaggy in Scooby Doo. Yeah, proto Shaggy. Which proto Shaggy. <laughs> this is how this Zoink. is the connection. It is, it is Zoinks. <laughs> they get to the temple and they're. Instead of just getting gold, what we find out is the thugs have gathered there. And again, they have a really great scene where it's dramatic, it's cold, it's dark. And the head thug is telling them, who looks like, oh, wait, but we missed the bridge. The I was bridge. Say, yeah, we missed, yeah. We the, missed bridge the bridge. Is, the bridge yeah. is on the way to the temple. And this is straight out of Temple of Doom, basically. Right. Yeah. What I love is the gag where. Din and Cary Grant Cutter are on the bridge. And of course, it's a rope bridge. And yeah. the elephant wants to cross. Right, right. Because she wants to be with her buddies. You know, but then ahead of time, he goes, Is this safe? Oh, yes. You know, Saeed, boom. You know, the good old trope right through one of the, you know, went through the slats right there. And then, yeah, so they make it across, you know, but, but it's great because, again, you have the rocking back and forth. And the camera work that they do on that is, is great. Because the cinematographer set it up so that the gag would be like mm -hmm. this with the camera mm -hmm. shaking back and forth. So they must have had some sort of gimbal or something to show it doing that. And then how they do the close-up shot of Annie, then going back on the, the bridge, mm -hmm. and then back into Annie again. So it has a little bit of that, mm -hmm, but again, they had a gimbal or something that was on it to, in order to, even though they weren't shaking it, it gave the impression. Whoever trained that elephant did a fantastic job. And that elephant, she's just like, she's a million bucks. She's loving every moment that she's on screen. And obviously, she had a good rapport with Sam Jaffe. Because when she's sick, how Jaffe just barely uses the hook. And she comes, like, right up. So I'm, I'm curious I'm curious about the elephant now, you know. The elephant in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then they get to the temple the thugs the head thug is saying we are going to destroy the british we are going to bring back the cult we are going to destroy we are kali yeah. and it's very menacing very dark they have all the light shot just right and this is actually again a really great scene where they're he's like bring the acolytes and their masters and so you have like all of the new guys coming forward he's like, bring the which in, a, in an awful it's like out of that scene from animal house i mean which is basically you know where it's bring the new guys in we have to make them go through the the temple rites here and now you're and now you're one of the the, the team joining yeah. but again uh, the 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 villain that was from temple of doom and mm -hmm. the character actor i can't remember his name right now that that played um the the head thuggy you know, apparently this is a legacy job because he keeps mentioning my father and my father's father. And the thing oh, about this thuggy cult George is Regas that George Regas is the actor. And he was Greek, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. And he played apparently Native Americans often. Well, he played Native Americans and the guy that they call Frogface also played, was, I believe, a Native American too. Okay. Um, his son also was another uh, character actor that was out there that went by like another name, like Zippo, Zippo Harpo, or something like that. So if you look for the the character actor that was there, so they had a lot of like you know RKO studio, mm -hmm. you know character actors available, and they all fit the roles very nicely. Again, the blackface is is a bit much. 
that's in there. But um, you can be able to tell that mm -hmm. definitely, Terrence, that there is Temple of Doom influence completely. One hundred percent. Because so. so there's actually a note on the Raider.net that this is one of the few films that can technically be called a prequel to Absolutely. Indiana Jones because yeah. the events that they cite in this movie in uh, Temple of Doom, they cite what happened in Gunga Din. Absolutely. Just it, again, they did a fantastic fantastic job yeah. on and it's so a great this set, set piece yeah this set yeah, piece amazing. is gorgeous yeah. it yeah. was really great so Cary grant's immediately like as much as i'm gold crazy we need to let the colonel and everyone else know what's going yeah. on and what i like is he doesn't you see him for like only one second think to himself i'm going to go he yeah. literally takes one step and realizes nope i can't do it and he nope. sends dean and he yeah. makes a distraction, which he takes out that one guy so that Dean can take his turban and everything. Yeah. Can I just say, I love that the irony of he suffocates a man. Yeah. And he does it in like the, uh, what I'll call the, the American yeah. way, because he just yeah. takes his arm and just yeah. does that choke yeah. hold until yeah. he falls down. Yeah, he gets him in a in a Richard Belzer, Hulk Hogan, you know, choke hold and, and, and takes the, the guy out. And then just, offhandedly then just goes back to dean and just says okay you gotta go i will have a distraction and lead into the classic distraction that he does which is good because when they do this this scene that's right there it is one of the more believable scenes of the movie mm -hmm. i'll let you go ahead and and, uh, and take over he just walks in. He starts being like the Britishest of British, and he is going to God save the Queen. Or I guess it would have been Keen at the time. And he yeah. just, no, it would have been Queen Victoria. He's like, God yeah. save the Queen. And he does a full, full British. If this was today, the movie, yeah. like they reset it in the timeline, he'd be talking about whoever the latest soccer or football team was yeah. walking forward just challenging people yeah. he's like full british oi 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 yeah. and the guy just stares at the head guy is like but remember ahead what? of time he adds in you're all under arrest yes and he you're says they're all, all under, under arrest, arrest. You know, and he's all of oh. you line up you're all under arrest and they're like <laughs> sure take him yeah. Take him, and that gives Dean enough time to to make it, you know, back there. Um, hops on, uh, hops on Annie, and then makes Annie. it back, you know. And when he gets back, immediately Victor McLaughlin's chewing him a new one, and he's like, yeah, and "You, he's, you yeah. are, you Our took ring, him. Ring. Yeah. What did you do with Cutter? You're getting court martialed, which is ironic because he can't be court martialed because yeah, he's know, not a, a part of the army, and yeah. all these things. And finally, like Gunga Dean is able to get enough out." about yeah. what's going on that cutter is in trouble and immediately what does victor mclaughlin do but he and valentine are going to go rescue him yeah. but valentine is out yeah. valentine is let go so yeah. how what do they do and this is one of those weird contrivances of the plot the double cross the double cross <laughs> because it's a double cross yeah Max says, I won't take a civilian out with me. He's like, but it's Cutter. We need to save him. He's like, I can't take a civilian. The yeah. British Army, all these things. He's like, yeah. well, okay. And he's like, oh, but I have but, an idea. Hang on just a second. I always keep something in my pocket here just for safekeeping, buddy. <laughs> this sounds like every Army recruiter I've heard about is like the classic sergeant who's like, I've got the papers right here. Yeah, just happen to have them. Yeah. And he says, I'll tell you what, sign up again and we'll tear up the papers when you get back. He's like, okay, but yeah. so long as I keep the papers because I don't trust you. He's like, you don't trust me to trust tear me. them up afterwards? He's like, yeah. no, I don't. No, 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 no. And then there's a tearful, tearful separation from Joan Fontaine. Yeah. As basically Cutter's like, listen, you want to unman me and no. I need to go save my buddy. Yeah. He quantifies everything, by the way. Everything he quantifies, which is, you know, and she keeps saying, well, you're, you're going to be leaving me to go drink with your buddies. No, no, we've never done anything like that before. So she keeps, you know, they, they have to keep a little bit, I mean, it's, it's intensity, but they have mm -hmm. to keep the humor of Joan Fontaine saying, because she doesn't believe him. She's just like, no, he's not in trouble. You assholes are going to get drunk. You want to get out of the thing and you want to have your cake and eat it too. My dad is here. 
and now we got to go travel back come on but and that's the other thing too is that that's where they introduce where she's in the conestoga wagon yes out in which, the middle of the kyber pass they bring her <laughs> out there i'm like again this makes no sense why she went to meet valentine to bring him back and you're yeah. just like but this doesn't make sense but this doesn't make any sense yeah and so the as Valentine is arguing with Joan Fontaine. Mac is sitting there on the horse like, and Cutter could be like getting killed right now. Yeah. And he's like, give me a few minutes. I'm sure Cutter would like a few more minutes it's too. A few minutes, yeah. And it's just, it's it's a wonderful little bit of comedic, um, that one, like the, the way that I've heard say, the best way to inject comedy into like a dramatic moment between two people is have a third person there that just has zero... Yeah, fight in the game. No, no skin in the game whatsoever. Yeah, I, I also just love the complete and utter. How do I phrase it? Hutzpah that they no. think these two, they two British sergeants and Gunga go to rescue Cutter. Well, of course, of course. Look, there may be thousands of people, you know, thousands and hundreds of, and out there. We don't know anything of the land. There, we have Gunga Din, who basically is our good luck charm through this whole thing. The guy's got like a, you know, like a horseshoe up his ass. He's going to take us there. Apparently, again, it turns out Gunga Din, it is an amazing equestrian. Yes. It just shows him just hopping on the, and they're taking off and he goes right behind him. Um, I also love how all of the, the saddles that they have in this movie are Western saddles. Yes. Yeah, they're all Western saddles. There's no British style saddles. There's no, you know, anybody riding side side saddle or anything like that. No, this is full on just like goddamn, you know, Western that's out there. Every one of the production elements of this movie feels like it is a Western instead of British Empire yeah. because like it doesn't feel like. So like when we watch period movies now, they do a much better job of obviously trying to oh, set yeah. it in the period. But in this po movie, they're like doing nothing to establish what the actual time period is this movie is supposed to take place in beyond whatever they say in the credits at the beginning. Yeah. None of the other pieces. Like maybe you can make the argument for the uniforms, but like that's even the uniforms don't look that dated British wise. Stevens should just say, you know what? We gave you a fucking gong at the beginning. The rest <laughs> of it is, is basically, you know what? Characters are going to come and go. You'll figure it out just like I did. You know? In uh, there, there's one shot here that I really like. When they reach the temple, it shows Valentine. It shows Mac on one side, like we get his profile, and then it literally, it's like this camera does a complete 180 turn. We see the entire temple, and then it turns to Valentine's yeah profile. And I'm like, yeah. that's actually a really elegant shot. That is a very good shot. Yeah. Now, did you read about the where they they shot that down in in the valley? And I didn't know Elephant that. Elephant Canyon, I believe, is the the name of it. I so th that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So because again, and it was another location that was probably used going all the way back to silent films mm -hmm. was in westerns, and I think it's it's here in California. I think the name of it is like Alabama or something like that. I've never been down in in that particular part of like the the desert, um, but it seems like it'd be some place that was relatively close to Los Angeles that you could be able to take basically a film, film crew that, that's out there. And if you take a look at the Wikipedia, you yeah. know, there it kind of looks a little bit like the Kyber Pass. They 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 fudge it a little bit. Yeah, filming uh, in October and 38, um, Alabama Hills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and it doubled as the Kyber Pass. I mean, really, I will say that I, I appreciate the fact that, again, this is the thing I miss about when we were talking about Indiana Jones. I miss real sets and real locations. And anytime they do that extra effort, I do appreciate it. Like, Secret of the Incas is one of the movies we talked about for yeah. uh, this Road to Indy 5. That film, for all of its flaws, the thing that stands out is they actually went to Peru and shot on location. Yeah, yeah. And it looks gorgeous for that reason. There's no green screen in this one, kiddos. No, but I green... do like if you read the Wikipedia how Fairbanks has to basically, you know, still defend the movie, and, and that he just randomly runs into to Indians are like, I can't believe that that wasn't, you know, the the Kyber Northwest Pass. India yeah. horseshit. But you know, c God bless Fairbanks was such just a, a charming man that you so, know 
you could we could get and get away with it if you look at i love so like wikipedia you click on his pick on his name and it shows this picture of exactly who i think douglas fairbanks jr would be it yeah. shows him like as an older dude with yeah. a with it like a, a flower in his yeah. lapel, lapel just yeah. pinstripe suit i'm like okay i have to give the guy credit he Ascot? aged exactly yes or no He's got a tie, like a beautiful, a well, okay. well done tie, though. Like, okay. That said, he could he could get wins with an or Ascot. not, obviously. Yes. Yeah. So it's got to be a wins or not on that. So one. like he's, I'm like Douglas Fairbanks Jr. That that's what I want to age into because he still looks <laughs> amazing. I'm sure at like whatever ninety that he was. I want to age here. into Elijah Cook Jr. You know, I just want to be just like one of those guys that just has like, you know, wild hair and just like big bulging eyes and things like that. Because, you know, it, I know I'm not going to with this. I'm not going to be glamorous. I just want to be like the Elijah Cook Jr. You know, just sort of just like somebody's like, oh, yeah, he's distinctive. Yeah. You know, character actor. <laughs> he just he just looks like somebody took silly putty, pressed it and just sort of squished it back down. You know, yeah, he's. That's a, that's a good look. Okay, so back to the film. We're back we're to there. the film. So yeah. they've gone off alone. Immediately, they get captured. Like, it's almost comical. They walk in and basically do the same thing that Cutter did. They're like, you're all under arrest. And it's like, there are more of us than you. Yeah. And the, the head guy goes, we have done what we set out to do. You get one English man, you then get two that try to rescue him. Yeah, I know. Which is good, because that that also sets up the fact that because this guy, again, you know, the the not so subtle racism that's in it, just saying that, you know, this guy is really smug. He thinks, you know, this is his country. This is his home turf. But how dare you? How dare you, my good man? And that's where, you know, it leads them into the next scene where they see Gary Grant has been, you know, strapped up mm -hmm. um, and they've they've given him, you know, lashings repeatedly. Which, so here's the thing I struggle with, with that particular bit. I think it's- But I'm probably on the same page. Well, <laughs> here's the thing. Like, I've read the Sharp novels. And yes. the first, the first Sharp novel, one of the things that apparently, because like the books are written out of order in chronological sequence. In that movie, in that book, the first one, they set up that he has been whipped. He has been lashed. Yes. And like that, those are scars he carries with him the rest of his life. And they- it basically could kill you very conceivably. Yes. I struggle to imagine that Cary Grant is anywhere near as flexible and active as he is. And the best part is that the, the him getting lashed, when you see it, it literally looks like someone just drew Hershey's syrup on Hershey's his back. Hershey's syrup on his back. Yeah. Hershey's and syrup on his back. Yeah. That when Max shows up, he immediately starts chewing Cutter out yeah. for. And then it's like, then he like, his shirt falls off and he sees the extent of the wounds and he's like, oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. You know, yeah. But here, this also has my favorite line in the entire movie. I wrote it down. Um, when they're having their argument, because Cutter's like, why didn't you idiots bring the army with you? Like we're asking. Yeah. Um, and Mac and Cutter are just arguing back and forth. They're like, Valentine, cut down Cutter. Valentine looks at both of them and says, you displease me greatly, and I ignore the both of you. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm like. Yeah. 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 That that's that's beautiful. good. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. That's line. that's that's your buddy shot right there in that that film. Uh. So so he's up there. They they take him down. But then the other thing too is is that there has to be like an elongated like comedic thing about how are we going to get him down because we have nothing. So it just it basically almost shows him like trying to chew his way out of it. Finally, they get like the bayonet and start cutting it down. And Grant like even throws in a, a line like, careful, I'm up here too. You know, that sort of stuff. So they, even when there's danger and approaching, they always just have to kind of throw just a little, a little bit of paprika and yeah. everything into the, into the mix of just like the, the comedic uh, aspect of it. And then the, the evil villain, the, the bad guy, the big bad, the head chief walks in and says, Tell me the troop movements. And yeah. McLaughlin's like, never. And this is one of those things where I kind of chuckle just because how did they ask, did he ask for this to happen? Because they take off his shirt and you're like, wow, McLaughlin was pretty well built. Like for that time, the guy, oh, yeah. the guy is not, because like 30s jacked is different than today jacked. Yeah. 
leaps and bounds. For one thing, they weren't using steroids back then. You know that McGotham was a boxer, professional boxer. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where he gets that that upper body, you know, strength. By by the quiet man, I mean basically it's like he he looks like a fucking bowling pin, you know, <laughs> just like big head and goes all the way back down. But yeah, he's barrel chested and and believable in that character, Terrence. And you're like, oh my goodness. Uh, and he, so they're going to beat him. He gets whipped a couple of times and he's finally like, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, but yeah. uh, you have to do it privately. And then yeah. he like, they step to the side. He's like, so, and again, this is the thing, like he wouldn't be this coherent after being whipped like that. No. But he's like, I don't know, but the papers in Ballantine's shirt sure has the true movements. Yeah. And the guy goes and takes the, they go back in, he takes the papers. And I love, again, it's just, it's a comedic moment where he he looks at the papers, you quickly realize, this this Indian dude has yeah. no idea how to read English. Well, and not only that too, but it's also, it, it goes back to the beginning of the film. It's the bullshit map. It's the bullshit map that was there. And of course, and then McGoughlin's like, well, you see, it's just that, but, 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 which gives him enough time to get the jump on, on mm -hmm. those guys. And McLaughlin has this eye movement where he looks over at the papers like yep. this. Yep, yep. And he well, just let me slams. Tell you, mate, you know, that sort of stuff, yeah. He slams the door because, of course, somehow this guy has allowed himself to be trapped in the room with them. Yeah. And he's like, where do those stairs go? He's like, not to freedom. Yeah. But they still charge up the stairs. Yeah, but we also forgot the our friends the snakes they oh the snake, the snake pit. pit yes the snake pit which, which is again goes back very to the indiana indian. jones yeah i love that scene because they're so like they're, after they beat him they threaten to throw mclaughlin into the snakes and that's yeah. the thing that makes him cave that for one thing my first thought was wow you guys didn't have much of a budget for snakes because it's no, like there's there's no real snakes there's in like there. 12 it looks like there are 12 snakes in there and you're and like, you can see the wires, by the yes. way, you know, with the cobra, because they're all cobras. So, and, you know, it, it, yeah. It's entered, it is a good plot device and a good idea. It's just oh, that absolutely. thing where it's like, you just needed to like give a, this is where Indiana Jones takes, what I love about Indiana Jones as a franchise, as a premise, is it took all these adventure stuff and said, what if we did it all? And what if we did it better? What yeah. if we took it one more step? And that's why I think that there's, it's very hard for there to be anything after Indiana Jones and the adventure column, just because it is the embodiment of everything that came before. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And it, it again, the, it's great with the the snakes. You have to introduce the the snakes in it, which is peril. Um, but you also know, seeing that that basically they're telegraphing how the baddie is gonna basically his doom. You don't put those snakes in there just as like you know as a it's a Chekhov's gun. Yeah, it, it exactly just right there. So we're back in there. Um, we're we're back with the oh yeah, and we also find out that the uh the, the character that was there that was introduced at the beginning of the movie that's his son, and he has some real daddy issues because once they take his father, he absolutely loses his marbles, and they try to get through the little bars that are right there in order to, to, to get, you know, to his father. And of course, you got our three guys who are sitting back there, um, you know, laughing their asses off, like, nope, 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 nope. And now we get into the classic stalemate. They are- That's up, yeah. The, trapped we, on we the roof. We know the troops are gonna arrive, now we gotta wait. They're trapped on the roof. They know the troops are on their way to rescue the rest of them, but they're also like laying a trap for them. Yeah. And I again, Cary Grant's reaction when he gets up to the top of the temple, because that's where the giant gold thing is. And it's literally like he turns into a cartoon character. Oh, yeah. and he goes, whoo! Yeah. And just, he's like, imagine it, imagine it. If you could take that arm, take that hand, take that hand. I bet it's worth 3,000 quid. You know, yeah. And but they're trapped up there. As that's going on, Here's our bad guy sitting there, lotus position, just just waiting. And then, piece. you know, again, proto Bond villain over explaining how he is going to kill you, therefore giving away exactly what the plot is, knowing that you're going to be easily defeated. 
you know, it's like once they bring in the one regiment, my men will come on the other side. And as they're doing that, you shall meet your doom. You shall meet your doom. And of course, you know, the entire time, the only guy who really has any any concern about well, this might not be end up very good is, is Fairbanks because he's kind of like, you know, wait a minute, this is we got to start taking this seriously. And Grant's over there already trying to scheme and plot and how to make his money. McLaughlin's like, it's going to be no problem whatsoever. You know, the, the, we're going to be rescued. Fairbanks is the only person that seems to understand the, the immediate peril that's in front of him. That's about it, you know. So, And they're in trouble. They, what yeah. are they going to do? They keep, Every time they like stick their heads up, the bad guys shoot at them. Uh, yeah. The head guy assures them as long as he's alive, they, they'll be fine, which that yeah. for, harbingers bad things. And they get, they're stuck. There is yep. nothing to do. It just kind of slows down. This is like classic stalemate, especially in a Western where you'd have the Indians on one side, the Alamo-esque scene mm -hmm. that we have here. Yep. And this is where my my memory on the film starts to get a little hazy. Oh no. Which, I, this, yeah. So I'll, I'll take, get you through this. Get, one. get me through here. I remember the end very distinctly, but that middle point here where we start to get to they're doing nothing and then everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Take it away. So <clears throat> we're up there. You have the, the super villain that's already over explained is basically how everybody is going to be doomed. And then once this starts, you know, this the reign of terror is going to, you know, drive all of the British out. The goddess right, Kali. Well, exactly. Now, so, but at that point, that's from, in the distance, you hear, bah, 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 you hear, start hearing the bagpipes. the bagpipes play. So at that point, McGoughlin, being the good Scott that he is, sees it, oh, hey, the boys are just here. But how are they going to, to get the attention of the troops that are there to notify them that not only that they're here, but also set them up for the impending battle. That's where it goes all the way back in the scene where Cary Grant is working with Din mm -hmm. and the regimental, how to do the trumpet. And that truly is one of the best, you know, scenes. There, That's the best is, scene in the movie. You know, it's like Din takes the initiative, you know, and goes up there, climbs up to the top, and that's after he's been he shot. He's after, well, he gets up there, then he gets shot. Oh, so okay. then he starts blowing the the bugle, and he keeps blowing the bugle. Gets shot. Keeps on getting back up again, and it doesn't really show any reaction shots of anybody that's down there. What's going on? It just focuses in on on Jaffe and slowly fading and dying, and then the action goes to, you know, the basically the thuggies versus versus the uh, the regimental british um and along with the regimental um uh the indians who again come and go how did know, they randomly in that movie uh, also question how did the thugs get cannon that's how one did of they the... get civil war cannon yes because yeah, that's civil... the thing that looks ridiculous i'm yeah. like those yeah. are like cannons from a cavalry movie yeah, it's it's Civil War canon. So yeah, and again, there's a few things in here. Again, but who it's the hell movies, about movies. India? So you you have to put in something that shows basically a common trope, you mm -hmm. know, for the moviegoer that was out there. Because this is a popcorn shirt. And then take consideration too, Terrence. Thirty nine. What other films are out there? Fucking Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. True. Thirty nine. I mean, it's like I mean, take a look at all those films. I mean, that was like. People always talk about how the, the summer of 75 was the one that really kind of turned cinema on its head because of Jaws, you know, breaking, you know, a big. But it was like the 39, you had like, take a look at all those films. Gunga Dan was like the number three film. Mm -hmm. Oh, this cinema. movie made yeah. an awesome amount of money. Yeah, almost what, two million bucks or something. 2.8 like eight. was the yeah. box office. Yeah, so go ahead and do the inflation calculator for 1939 versus 2013. That's a shit ton of money to be number three. And take consideration, too, that like Wizard of Oz, people thought that was a shit burger. You know, Gunga Din, people liked that movie, but it was a popcorn chewer. And then you had Gone with the Wind and everything else that was out there. And Gone with the Wind, like still because of inflation calculations, oh, yeah. is one of the biggest movies ever. 
Oh yeah. It and Titanic. So we're there. So we're there. Here comes the regimental British. Here comes the thuggies. And now they're having, you know, the, the rumble in the Kyber pass. And at that point, no wonder why you, you didn't, you know, you really, it all becomes anything. white noise. It just becomes white noise. And, you know, there's really nothing important, you know, because you know, that, you know, that our principals are going to mm-hmm. escape. We the, know that. Our, our and the principals escape. are being forced to watch all of this happen. Yeah. By the thugs. But at the same time, too, as the thugs are getting their asses kicked, they're cheering on on the good guys. So, I mean, again, so and that that part, again, just sort of Terrence, you're, you're right. It's just it's all kind of like white noise. You know, where mm-hmm. it's, go. It, it's the denouement. It's the final climax. It's like the best way to describe it is I this is the thing I really get bothered by with stories is when the third act just becomes rote. Oh, yeah. And I feel like this is the Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies point where it's like hey, we have gave you burrs and trees. What the fuck more do you want? I know. <laughs> you got a bird, you got a tree. What are you bitching about? Come on, we gave you all this stuff. But going back to the to the film, so um our protagonist is dead. And so blah 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 fight. And then that's where they have to introduce the fucking Kipling character because they have to but bookend There's everything. the thing I love. They don't tell you who it is up that's until the very is. end. Yes, they just exactly. assume this walrus mustached glasses man who's referred to as a journalist Yeah, that you're just going to either know or not. Yeah. And yeah. then it's at the very end. So here's yeah. where my memory instantly clicks because yeah. I, I actually, again, I'm a big fan of Kipling. Uh, the man, the man who would be king, is one of my favorite. I was going to say you and I are probably the the same page on that one. A lot of ch- chewing scenery there by Connery, you know. And by, someday uh, we will yeah. have to do an episode on that movie. So they have so Gunga is dead. Kipling is sitting there in the as you just see the aftermath of the battle. Yeah, and Kipling is sitting there scribbling on his notepad. You have to have the reporter's notepad mm-hmm. running away. You know, just scribble, scribble, scribble. And I think he just, he shows it to the colonel. The colonel's like, that's elegant. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. And you just see Cutter, Valentine, and Mac around the body of Din that's been wrapped up in a shroud. Yeah. And the colonel says, for his heroism, we are going to make him a corporal. So he is on the list of our honored dead. And then he stands there over the body and reads the final stanza of the Kipling poem. So I'll meet him later on at the place where he is gone, where it is always double drill and no canteen. He'll be sit squatting on the coals, giving drink to poor damn souls. And I'll get a swig in hell from Gunga Dean. Yes, Dean, Dean, Dean. You Lazarethan leather Gunga Dean, though I've belted you and filleted you by the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Dean. Now, what I love about as they are doing that poem, they're reading the the poem in the frame, the music A transitions to Old Lang Syne. Yep. And B, the part where it talks about I've belted and flayed you, it takes the camera pan cuts to McLaughlin. Yeah. Who has been the most cruel. The heavy. To, the heavy. Yeah, He's the, been yeah, the, heavy. the mean yeah. to Gunga. And you see yeah. him have emotion about this. Yeah. He has a redemption moment. He yeah. has a redemption moment. Yeah. So, and that's just how the movie ends is yeah, poem, end. yeah. music, yeah. and we just assume that the thug has been taken care of once and for all. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the John Ford thing where basically, you know, uh, where it ends with the battle. It ends with the battle. The good guys won. We don't necessarily know or give a shit about, <laughs> about what's going to happen afterwards because our protagonists have done that. What's happened to Joan Fontaine? We don't know. What's happened to her father? We don't. <laughs> What's yeah. happened to Joan Fontaine's father is the real yeah, question what, of this movie. Yeah, just... uh, yeah, what Cutter like Cutter obviously is going to go after the treasure again at some point is my question. Oh, yeah. That oh, there yeah. is that sequel somewhere. I think yeah. that they do say Valentine had Valentine tells the Colonel I'm re-upping. Yeah, but that doesn't say what happens people. with yeah. Joan Fontaine. Yeah. Just... She went back to England with her dad. You know, I mean, that that's, let's see, go back in here and. What, 
so what in the, watching this go around was there anything that stood out to you uh that you hadn't what, picked up on before i hadn't picked up on before because I, before i had watched it on a, a larger screen this time I, I just watched it basically on a tablet mm -hmm. was the the very quick jump cuts that they did in, in the fights that showed up you know very easily but the other thing that that i did take away from it this time was that um there is a connection that goes to, to indiana jones uh which is what we we're going to be talking about but at the same time too um it also kind of sets the template for as you're right the three musketeer buddy film mm -hmm. that's out there which would later you know be be driven into the ground in the 1980s you know um and again you're right it did have a little bit of the the three stooges in it um you you basically had somebody that acquired the rights to the kipling story thought okay we can make something out of this they hire you know the guy who did bring it up baby because he's got a good relationship rko said mm, no this guy fucked up he we lost an awful lot of money you know your ass is out they go bring in a ringer like george stevens meat potatoes guy you know and then basically probably the i didn't read about the two screenwriters you know very much about them um but i just have to assume that basically they probably when they knew that um george stevens was coming in they probably modified the i imagine modified the script in order to go a little bit more for a George Stephen esque um, mm -hmm. film. That was the other thing too. You could watch this film. You don't even need to know who the director is to know that it's a George Stevens film. Um, you know, and and my uncle Jim actually has a relation. He knew George Stevens. He worked oh, with. Oh, cool. The, oh yeah. Well, he knew George Stevens Jr. Uh, you know, set up the AFI. You know that, right? No, I didn't. Oh, there's another. We'll put a pin in that one because there's an entire story that Jim Silk actually is one of the people who created the AFI, um, and that's my uncle. Everybody, uh, he created the AFI. They basically threw this thing together over the course of a week because wow. LBJ was like, "Well, we gotta have some sort of, you know, American Film Institute, y'all." And so they just—it was George, George Stevens, uh, Jack Valenti. Other all these principles, yeah. Um, again, we'll we'll talk about it sometime down the road, and maybe if Jim's up to it, he could be able to kind of tell you what's going on. But again, you can tell this is a George Stevens film. George mm -hmm. Stevens had a style of his own. So even if you don't know who George Stevens is, an awful lot of his filmmaking ends up in contemporary filmmaking. Probably the biggest proponent for George Stevens would probably be Quentin Tarantino. Mm -hmm. There's a shit ton of stuff where you could watch a Tarantino film and be like, um, yeah, you know what? God damn it, that's that's George Stevens right there. You know, he for as obnoxious as that as Tarantino can be in grading on the nerves, he is a student of film. He's the mm -hmm. original film Napster, where he basically steals other people's content and puts it out there for free. You know, um, but at the same time, too, I mean, that was the other thing too. I watched it and I was like, yeah, boy, this is really. This is where George Stevens, probably in my mind, developed the first like true George Stevens movie in 39. And then the final thing was it suddenly occurred to me that year. I'm like, Jesus Christ, if this was done in like in 38, this would have been the biggest film. If this was done in, in yeah. 40, this would have been the biggest film that was out there. But instead, because it came out in 39, mid, mid Decker, because you, know, you and again, I mean, it made a shit ton of money. And it was a respected film, but I mean, you had Gone with the Wind up here, and then you had The Wizard of Oz and all these other films. You know, that could be something for a podcast there, 39 versus 75, because the films of 1939 versus 1975. It's always amazing to see how you get those clusters of like the the high points, yeah. because like uh, a comparison would also be like 89. We get um, Batman. Yeah. And there was like two or three other like hard hitting big movies that came out yeah. that that particular year. Uh, wasn't that eighty nine the the first one the Cohen Brothers the, the film that was out there in eighty nine, the I, one I'm, where they're they're Bargo? people in the woods. Uh, the about that time was like the one that was like right after uh, Raising Arizona. I, I'm, I'm bad at remembering 
That's okay. Fil film uh, years is not one of my specialties either. Yeah, I'm, I'm just sorry, sorry, everybody. Last Crusade came out in '89 too. Okay. Um, I was like, I knew at least one of the indie movies came out that year. Yeah. But we also got Dead Poet Society, oh, yeah. Field of Dreams, Born on the Fourth yeah. of July, Driving Miss Daisy. Mm -hmm. Who who doesn't want and Roadhouse like Roadhouse obviously that Again, film. We could just do just a podcast based upon roadhouse which is to i mean you know just as a sidebar again roadhouse to me was basically the first time where a screenwriter said you know what we're at the end of the canon here i'm going to do a movie that's a parody it's going to be over the, the heads of everybody they're not going to get it but then at the same time too hey um can i do a movie that has terry funk in it and can i have him fighting people in his wrestling boots is that okay? And can I have my buddy John Doe from the band X in there uh, who uh, has to have a shotgun down near his crotch pumping it away? And, you know, so it, it, can I have like throwaway lines about like ass rape and stuff like that? Like that movie, it just works on so many different, so many different levels. The only guy that seems to really get it is actually the creator of Family Guy. He seems to be such a huge fan uh, that I wish I wish they would let him go do like his remake of. Well, so they actually are doing a remake of Roadhouse right now, uh, which depresses me. Other than I think the guy, this is important, people. Roadhouse twenty twenty three remake. I know Jake Gyllenhaal is in it. Conor McGregor is in it. Doug Liman's directing. Well, who are the producers? Because Joe Silver is producing oh well then you're fucked america sorry because you know what the you're more end up disappointing with... thing is amazon studios is the one doing it hey a3 you know what they got a shit ton of fucking money behind them those guys True. over there at amazon i mean now they might do the same thing that they did with you know with batgirl where you're, you're basically you pulling the plug on it because it's just it ain't it ain't gonna be good uh out there but yeah they should let uh, what's his name the guy who created family guy um, uh todd Mc, mcfarlane uh yeah, well, no no wait a minute it's family guy i should know this this guy you know he's been all over the place but he seems to be one of the few people that like seth get, mcfarlane yeah seth mcfarlane which seth MacFarlane may be one of the few people that gets that that is a tongue-in-cheek parody of an action film yeah which like he did the orville which is arguably better star trek than most star trek yeah, exactly. It's more Star Trek than Star Trek. You are correct about that. Yeah. So, but again, I mean, uh, I, I, so actually, that leads to yeah. the question I have on this movie. Do yes. you, how would you feel if they? What are your thoughts on a Gunga Din remake? Do you think it's a film that should be remade? And if so, who would you want like creative on it? I would say that you cannot make a film like Gunga Din these days simply because of content and mm -hmm. i think that if i was a producer and somebody said hey you know we got the the kipling stuff laid out here it's all in in public domain um you know we're thinking about redoing gunga din the first thing i would be like well you know what um who are we gonna be able to find in bollywood to be able to, to play all these, these yeah. principal characters here so and then we have to find somebody over in we have to find indian actors who um are gonna be okay Mm -hmm. with the portrayal of, of Gunga Din. Now, can we do it uh, the same way that it was written as a period piece? Or are we going to make it more, more contemporary? Or the other thing, too, is you could just take the plot of Gunga Din, have a Tim Heidecker that, that's out there, just go, yeah, we're going to take Gunga Din, and we're going to spin it 180 de degrees. We're just basically, you just you have this guy who is, really wants to be part of like something larger mm -hmm. because he's an outsider but he sees that these guys are doing things you know that are like significant he also is basically betraying his own people so you you have you, you, if you could be able to combine that stuff mm -hmm. and then you know i guess now if they would be doing anything about gunga din it probably would be a biopic about kipling mm -hmm. which I would be very, like, there's a fantastic biography I'm reading right now on Kipling by Andrew Lysette. Okay. Uh, it It's fantastic so far. But okay. Kipling as a, 
because he has a distinct look. That's why every version of Kipling you see looks the same. They just put glasses and a big mustache on a guy. Yeah. And he was around for interesting things. Yeah. And he created so much of what everyone knows what the Jungle Book is. Yeah. 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 It just things like that. I think that a biopic, I'd love to see that version. That would be good. You know, they could, and it could go either way because you could do it. I mean, you could do the biopic and you could play it just straight down the middle, just talking about his life, what led mm-hmm. him to, you know, be be an author, any of the the triumphs and tragedies that he, that he had, or it could just be basically kind of you could do the fish out of water uh, trope that that's there, which is basically this guy just keeps on ending up in all these like little stories. Uh-huh. And how did you do that through your travels throughout the the world? I mean, you know. So it would, you would basically, you would have him the content floss of uh, around the world in, in eight, 180 days. I mean, that's, if you're going to be doing it, you would just do it basically that somebody who's very prim, very, you know, mm-hmm. for Dinn, very prim, very proper, that he's in there. Mm-hmm. He's the foil to the other person that's there, to the David Niven. But David Niven has respect for him because you know the culture, you know this. You can be able to, to charm all these women you know why i'm here like trying to do all the machinations and things like that so that might be the way you could be able to pull off and in some ways around the world in 180 days does have a little bit of like the gunga din it does yeah just there's a there's an odd amount of it actually like i round world in eight days is one of my favorite books i joke that when i went through in my head what are the characters that like i based myself off of weirdly enough phileas fog is one of those like keystone characters in my brain so when you go through the book, you're like, oh, wow. Like it definitely has this large set piece in India. Yeah. 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 I think I would be more like the, the character in, um, what was the Blake Edwards film that he, that he had around the, the, the one with the car that drove around. Oh, the Jack um, Lemon character, Professor, Professor Fate. I want to be like, yes, Professor. it's, um, around the, it's, uh, the, the, the greatest, the great, the the great race. 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 Oh right, my right. goodness, yeah. that movie yeah. is so gorgeous. I, I ever watched it be, last year. That's another film you can be able to do because that, that film is great because it's got tons of set pieces. Mm-hmm. It's got tons of great, great character actors. And again, Jack Jack Lemon as Professor Fate is he's just, just is chewing great. the scenery every time he's on stage on screen. And but, Tony Curtis, like my goodness, just the unflappable oh yeah. debonair. They even have the little gleam that goes in his eye and the teeth and Professor Fate. Who does he have as his basically as his henchman? You 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 basically you have Columbo. Yes, you know, you, you, you have, that's right. Yeah, you have Columbo. Max. So I've been rewatching Columbo, which makes that even better. There you go. So there you go. So I guess wrapping up everything, I, mm-hmm. if there's going to be a contemporary that was going to be made, it probably couldn't be made. Um, if somebody just said, "Hey, we got this. We got this whole thing with the the Kipling estate dropped on us." Let's do a biopic. It's like, well, do we play it straight or do we do it for comedy? Again, mm-hmm. that's going to end up in the the second book of developmental hell because yeah. you just you can't. I mean, look, they tried with the Jungle Book, yeah, to re- reboot that, and it was a fuck up. I mean, that thing was just terrible. So I had to redo Kim. So I do enjoy the Disney one that they did, the new one. And that's only for the fact that they actually introduced the Kipling elements into the story, which the first one doesn't. And Idris Elba makes a brilliant Shere Khan. But beyond that, it's like I I wasn't super fond of uh, Bill Murray as Baloo. Uh, But I mean, that's a story that honestly... No sale. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike, thank you for joining us to talk about Gunga Din. Where can people go to learn more about you, your work, and of course, Grizzly Pulp? Well, Grizzly Pulp, and um, I guess we can just say that there, this, there's going to be a delightful Huckleberry that is going to be uh, working and collaborating with us in the not so distant future. We're going to be leaving the fascinating world of Toki Wedge and heading over into a Terrence's book, which mm-hmm. is uh, at one point going to be published. Right now, we're just kind of going through the, uh, the, as we say, the meat and potatoes part of doing his guts. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that we have coming out will be uh, touching back to Jim Silk. We're going to be mm-hmm. reissuing um, the Death Dealer series, which was a uh, series of uh, fantasy books that were released uh, by Tor in the early 90s. Um, as I like to tell people, it's 100% Danzig free. Glenn Danzig, if you are listening to this podcast, and you probably aren't right now. 
but if we we are we're, we're taking back our property and we're releasing it back in the world minus your crappy comic book and there is no child rape this is 100 child rape free that's good yeah yeah because you know i'm looking directly at you <laughs> because your crappy you know like comic book really pissed off uh the person who was the writer not frank frazetta pissed off jim sill so if you're listening to us right now it's 100 percent free of dancing mother i i love the fantasy grizzly pulp logo you guys came up with too by the way well so here's the thing that actually is i had an epiphany because i was looking at the tour logo and i was looking at our crest i was like shit all i gotta do is just put stars over the top of it and i look like to everybody else i look like a genius i went back to my designer and i'm just like put stars over the top of it sarah and she's like yeah i think that would work that's a great idea and i'm like yeah i know it is it's <laughs> again the most brilliant ideas to people are the things that grizzlypulp.com mm -hmm. you'd be able to find us but beyond that too um an awful lot of the content that I've reintroduced back in here, it's stuff that's already, if people love the design that we do with the font, you know, and all that design. I'm just ripping off stuff that was done in the 1980s by Crip Records. Sorry. It looks like it, it's like really original stuff. I'm just ripping off the stuff that Crip mm -hmm. did. I'm ripping off the stuff they did in Kicks Magazine. I'm ripping off everything that I grew up as a kid and made like mental notes like it's someday I'll go ahead and reuse this. But that's perfect for this conversation because that's what Indiana Jones is. Oh, yeah. Indiana Jones is oh, nothing yeah. but ripped off every idea under the sun. Yeah. And created it around a character who happened to be portrayed by one of the charismatic actors of Hollywood. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and here's the thing about Indiana Jones that I picked up on early and still today. He's the most likable grave robber you'll ever yes. meet in your entire life. Literally, if Indiana Jones was doing this shit today, he would be looking, you know, Interpol would be looking for this guy because you are stealing antiquity. There's a lot of museums that are out there that now have to basically, you know, kind of atone for what they've done. Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones, at least that character knows that he's stealing shit. But he's trying to keep it away from the Nazis. Okay, that's yeah. Good. Or he's trying to keep it away from bad guys. Now, it's going to end up in a museum. It's going to end up in a collection. And as you see with the Ark of the Covenant at the end, you know, it's it may just end up someplace kind of like Xanadu, you know, Charles Foster Kane, which, again, they, there you go. The, at that end of that, that movie, it's the same fucking ripoff that they, they mm -hmm. did. That scene where it's going back there was the same thing that they did in Citizen Kane where it had all of Kane's antiquity that's mm -hmm. there just tons of antiquity now of course they had to go throw in you know rosebud at the end of it but our rosebud basically is you know top men top men you know that that's a they should have ended the series with that because it was just perfect because it's like you know well what are you going to do with this thing i mean it's it's a it's basically a death machine mm -hmm. don't worry we we got it top men. top men top, top men, men got this not men, you know, and so, and I think that that is kind of the way you have to sort of look at the first Indiana Jones. They had top men working on this thing. They even had like little, the other thing too, Terrence, is, you know, they had Easter eggs mm -hmm. thrown in it. So if you take a look at the plane when it's leaving with the guy with Reggie and his snake, it says C-3PO, mm -hmm. you know, it's on the plane. Oh yeah. So in the, in the well of souls, in the hieroglyphics, they've got R2-D2 and 3PO. Exactly. I, I love the fact that George Lucas is okay with being self-referential. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he made... He made Club Obi-Wan. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Which he, I will he, maintain. Well, Temple of Doom is not one of the... It's... Of the three, it's the one I like least, but I still yeah. like it on its own. Because of that opening sequence, it's very James Bond, and it... That whole scene with the passing of the things, it's well done. Just perfect tension. Yeah, it is. And in addition to that, too, like I said at the beginning of our conversation, somebody at Disney said, you we know can, what? Put, we can do this. Put a pin in that thing because, you know, the Enchanted Tiki Room ain't, ain't drawn. It ain't dry like enough. It used to. And, uh, and we got this Jungle Cruise that's over there. And we got, you know, we got the Swiss Family Robinson. What, what are we doing here? You know, let's just go ahead and put Indiana Jones right there. Uh, and again, I mean, it, it, that just kind of shows the 
the the forward thinking brilliance of of somebody like Disney, which was, you know, they could see something like that and you can give it over to the Imagineers and they can go, yeah, shit, we could be able to do something with it. I'm not too convinced that this Star Wars land is, is a good idea because the argument that I have is, is basically, why are you paying to be basically walking around a police state? Yeah. You know? And, and basically, you know, th- what you're doing is you're having people portraying cops harassing you. You could do that the other 364 days of the year and not have to pay 100 bucks or whatever the fuck to get in there. Because essentially, that's what it is. You're in an occupied land, a hostile force. And the also, it's an allegory for just the way that, that fucking Disney treats the city and county of Anaheim. So when people are like, hey, I'm going to go to, you know, to, to Disneyland and I'm going to go to the Star Warsville or wherever the fuck it is. I'm just like, yeah, have fun. Why don't you, you know what? Why don't you go to Beirut? They'd have more same, fun there. Same thing. <laughs> on that note, Mike. On that upbeat note. Thanks again for coming on welcome. the show. And it's always go to grizzlypulp.com and everybody, Terrence, uh, will be, I'm sure, talking about his his next book. Go out 100%. and get the first one. Yeah. Just one last thing. Terrence did it the right way. Most people tell you the easiest way to get into publishing is write a romance novel. Terrence did it the right way. And in and uh, Grizzly Pulp did it the wrong way, which was basically find a bunch of uh, obscure pulp books in public domain. I'll leave you with that, everybody. Thanks again, Mike. You're very welcome.